Hey, can everybody hear me now? Okay, great. Yes. I'm just using the computer on the computer audio, so I apologize if the connection is a little degraded. We were having some troubles with the phone mic. Anyway, I will jump back to the beginning and just go through the first couple of slides really quickly. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Thanks for joining us for this project called Vision Webinar. Uh, I'll move to the next slide. We're going to be walking through uh, first some updates to the RFP response process. Uh, we've introduced a couple of changes um, in order to facilitate ultimately the creation of better projects. And so we'll talk through that. And then we'll spend 15 minutes talking about uh, the actual details of the proposal of the RFP itself. Um, I'll invite uh, you guys to submit questions um, through the messaging feature of GoToMeeting, and I'll answer them um, as I get them. And um, at this point, we'll do 15 minutes just sort of walking through uh, the details of the project call summary, as well as outlining some of the key requirements. Uh, and then I'll also invite Kevin uh, McDonough, our CTO, to jump in whenever and, and add additional details about the context in, in which this proposal was developed. And we'll share a little bit with you about how we use some interesting agile uh, sort of feedback tools to make sure that we designed a project call that was really responsive to the needs that you guys have identified over the last couple of uh, months in our uh, various meetings and workshops. And finally, uh, we'll have 30 minutes of Q&A. So, as I mentioned, uh, we've made some changes to the RFP response process. All of this information, by the way, can be found in the PPK, which is available for download on the DMDAI website. Uh, so if you don't have those files already, I would encourage you to grab them after this meeting is over. For now, everything you need is, is right here. Um, all of this information is consistent with what's in the PPK. So. Uh, the purpose of the changes that we've made to this process is to create more touch points throughout the process because we want to make sure that people are getting feedback early on about whether or not the uh, general solution space that they're working in is, is sort of consistent with our vision for the project solution. And so we've introduced a number of new steps, uh, the first of which uh, is this uh, webinar. So you can see that's where that blue dotted line is. We're just at the beginning of the, the process. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this is a chance for us to uh, kick off the project call response process and help get you guys thinking in the right sort of uh, frame, uh, state of mind about what we're anticipating solutions are going to look like. And then the next uh, interesting addition that we've made is a group uh, pitch session, which is going to be on Monday 7-23. And this is an event that is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get into the details later, but it's it's encouraged, not mandatory to participate, but it's another opportunity for you to sort of share your preliminary idea for a proposal and get some preliminary feedback as well from the DMDI project team staff, as well as uh, members of the DMDI community. Then we have executive summaries. Uh, we'll do uh, actually a down select of uh, the executive summaries. Um, so it's um, it's important to note that uh, you know we will be evaluating those based on criteria that I'll I'll get to later. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a, a glimpse. I think a pretty handy glimpse at the timeline of events. And finally, we'll be making notifications. Uh, we'll be inviting teams to submit full, full proposals. Um, in September, and we'll be notifying the final selections in October. Again, if you have questions, feel free to shoot me a message in the GoToMeeting, and I will get to them in the second half of this meeting. And again, this is just a, a sort of chronological list of the events. So you've got that in timeline form, you've got that in just a list of all the tasks. These are the key milestones. Um, of the RFP response process. So I've already sort of touched on what the vision webinar is. Um, uh, the only thing that I would like to add at this point is uh, we'll be publishing a list of all the attendees uh, as of this webinar. And so this is sort of an opportunity for team dating. You can also see in the GoToMeeting window, I believe you have visibility as to who's attending. And so it's an opportunity for you to start to get a sense of who is going to be interested in working in this problem space and you can start to put your teams together. So 
a pretty handy, I think, uh, first touch point to kick this off. So I want to take a few minutes to talk about the group pitch session because I've gotten some questions about that already, uh, which is good. I'm, I'm glad to be receiving questions because it means you guys are interested in, in, in helping us, you know, make sure we get this process right and, and work through it the first time. So the, the inspiration for this group pitch session is sort of a think DMDII meets uh, Shark Tank. We, we really want to encourage um, the individuals and project teams to think about how to best communicate their solution in you know as efficiently of a time as possible. So we're limiting this to 10 minutes. You've got 10 minutes to present uh, sort of a rough draft, an overview of your solution, um, and it'll be followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. And the focus of the presentations, again, is outcomes and use cases. So at this stage, it's not necessary for you to have developed the entire technical strategy for uh, your proposal, uh, because that's not the expectation. You'll have a chance to develop that a little further for your executive summary, and then you'll have a chance to really do that for the full white paper submission for the proposal. Um, but so this is just sort of uh, to get us thinking in terms of who, uh, whose needs are the solutions addressing? Um, what are some of the key metrics uh, or key performance indicators that, um, that we will use to measure the success of a project like this? And what are some of the outcomes going to look like? Will it be a software prototype, um, some sort of integrated toolkit? Uh, and so there's no template that we're providing for this because we really want to encourage teams to really think through all the details on their own. Uh, but uh, it's you know, suggested that you look at the executive summary for uh, important points to consider when you're putting your slides together. Uh, so if you want to participate in this, uh, you can sign up as a team uh, with uh, non-members, by the way, uh, you're, you're able to bring non-members to this event uh, because we'd like to, if possible, use it as an opportunity to you know, expand the DMBI community. So if you're invited to, if you submit an executive summary um, and are invited to submit a full proposal, then it'll be a requirement that they become DMBI members. But this pitch session is open to um, non-members as well. And so I'm just asking teams to email myself. Uh, the deadline is, uh, I believe, at the end of this week to sign up for a uh, slot for the pitch session. It might be next Monday, actually. And um, that, so whatever's written there, 716, you've got to uh, shoot me a message as well as RSVP on the um, Eventbrite, which was also included, a link to that can be found in the PPK. It was also included in the original email announced in the kickoff of the project call. Uh, so you've got to register for that and also send me an email and we'll coordinate setting up a slot. Uh, lastly, it's not required if you do participate to join for the entirety of the pitch session. Uh, but again, it's encouraged uh, that you stay for as much as possible because we would like to make this as much of a community uh, engagement as we can and it's a great way to get some feedback on your idea and also see what spaces other teams are working in and if possible uh, different groups can potentially combine teams where it makes sense to do so if there are sort of synergies in the solution spaces. Okay so that's the group pitch session and again all the dates to these can be found in the PPK as well as in the slides at the beginning of this presentation. For the executive summary, <clears throat> we've made some changes to this as well. Um, the um, template for this, there is a template and it can be found in the uh, PPK. So that's all I will speak to you about the executive summary at this point. We've just introduced some new questions uh, to get you again thinking in terms of the, the right uh, guidelines for how to build, how to engineer uh, the highest impact, highest value projects. Uh, so I've got um, an overview of the criteria here for the executive summaries. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, there are, as, as before, there are full uh, technical proposal templates that can be found in the PPK. And I will defer to the PPK for a full breakdown of the different criteria for that we will be using as a team, uh, as a projects team, to evaluate the full technical proposal. Um, and the breakdown of those is in the PPK. 
So at this point, uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're right on schedule here. And we're gonna talk about the proposal itself. So this is DMDAI 18-1 AI Design Advisor. Uh, we're pretty excited about this project. I think it's been um, designed in a, in a pretty iterative, uh, iterative and agile way. We've been working with our agile tech teams, with the design agile tech team, and uh, using some of the needs that we've identified in those calls. Uh, based on your feedback on other projects, past projects, and then we've taken that at the the March Moving Manufacturing Left workshop, and we kind of developed use cases there. We we worked with the people that attended to try to convert some of the needs into problem statements, um, and then over the the last couple of months, I've been working uh, with with my team to really build out a proposal that's going to try to uh, move the ball forward in the space of digital design. So uh, the thesis of this project, uh, well, I guess th there are a number of problems that sort of lead to the, the thesis that is driving this uh, proposal. It's kind of, there's, there's a whole full text of the summary is, is kind of outlines a lot of these different um, problem statements, but Something that we've um, we've noticed as we've done a lot of um, we've made investments in R and D aimed at moving manufacturing leftwards, but something that um, I think we made that is perhaps being neglected is that design engineers are increasingly burdened with new responsibilities. So um, as the the onus of uh, moving manufacturing left actually sh shifts leftwards in the organization. Uh, more and more decisions are expected to be made up front by design engineers. So we want to enable those design engineers to have better insight into how the decisions that they make are going to drive changes downstream. Um, in addition, uh, the systems engineering practices have just really uh, not kept pace with uh, the complexity of, of the products that are being produced. And we know that uh, engineering change requests can be quite expensive, especially as the complexity of the product increases. Um, so an engineering change request has a different implication for, for example, an electric toothbrush versus a um, airplane. Um, and so these are, again, something to consider for the scope of this project. Uh, I, simultaneously, we know that there are huge amounts of, of data that are being produced uh, by downstream enterprise activity from the design phase. So manufacturing, uh, assembly, um, shipping, um, servicing, maintenance, all of these different enterprise activities, whether they're within the actual OEM's um, organization or perhaps uh, in partners of the OEM, there are lots, there are, there's a lot of data that's being produced. And uh, the question that we're asking is how can we take this data and, and apply um, new analysis techniques to this data to inform design decision making. And finally, there are a number of uh, design assist tools in the space of you know AI and machine learning. Uh, but the current state is that most most of those focus in the realm of physics based uh, predictive and generative design. So that would be, for example, um, if you're designing like a wing of an aircraft, you can identify the different load points and set your material properties and it'll generate an organic shape for you that you could, for example, um, 3D print out of metal. Uh, but while, while those uh, work more in the, the realm of, of physics space and predictive design algorithms, uh, this project actually seeks to leverage historical data. Uh, so data, as I mentioned, from enterprise activity on stream from the past and the present. And so the kind of crux of the project call is that um, it is seeking solutions that will build on existing project learnings to develop solutions that utilize artificial intelligence to either generate recommendations for a design engineer or automate portions of the design process based on data from downstream activities, manufacturing, assembly, quality service, and repair. And as I said, the, the focus is to leverage historical data sets and build on these current predictive design capabilities. So we're not saying uh, that we don't want to uh, leverage the predictive design capabilities, but rather we want to build on them to enable uh, better 
human and AI collaboration. Um, and obviously part of this is uh, enabling enhanced interoperability, data connectivity, and the goal is to enable our design engineers to make better decisions up front. So there can be uh, fewer design cycles and ultimately you know, build uh, better projects, build better parts and make every part better than the last. So here are a list of project requirements uh, for the first phase. Uh, these were developed and, and refined pretty meticulously. So uh, I know that there are a number of requirements, but they're, they're all you know important. So you should be sure to um, think about each individual requirement. <coughs> um, I'll just run through them really quickly. Uh, so identify how to best make use of downstream data. So that question is sort of asking, uh, what actually is the best approach to analyzing this data? Uh, we want to define strategies for linking design feedback to the evaluation requirements, define measures of effectiveness. Uh, so that is sort of speaking to the defining uh, KPIs for the project, generating a set of software requirements and business rules to uh, be followed, developing software architecture to enable artificially intelligent design feedback tools, defining a demonstration use case for the phase two effort, anticipating and planning for cultural and organizational inertia regarding the workflow innovation that is associated with uh, radically disrupting uh, digital design tools that we use to build products, and finally developing a go-to market strategy. Uh, and then lastly, there is a second phase for the project, uh, which will actually focus on the integration and implementation um, and building out that test bed of the requirements that are sort of defined in the first phase. And so you'll be employing an agile methodology, integrating the solutions, generating the machine learning algorithms and developing a software prototype. Um, we're, we're definitely asking a lot of, of teams this time around. So uh, that's, I think that it's a pretty exciting opportunity to, uh, to work on this. We all are also expecting that you will demonstrate the full capabilities of a software prototype in one or more working environments, develop vendor agnostic and part or family agnostic guidelines uh, and lessons learned content that will enable members of the broader DMDI community to sharpen their own digital design strategies. And that's sort of speaking to what happens after this project when it concludes. Uh, you'll be developing a playbook to aid organizations in the adoption of the technology uh, developed based on technical, cultural, and organizational considerations. And finally, uh, you will provide training materials on the benefit of the new software and how organizations and individuals uh, will utilize the new tools developed. And uh, these are some additional criteria, which is that the main project outcome must be a software solution that will be commercially ready in uh, 2020, which is assuming a project kicked off by January of 2019. Uh, tools should focus on aiding design engineers during the early concept design phase or modifying an existing part for a new purpose. Uh, so a redesign of a part perhaps, uh, the tool must provide automated solutions uh, based on real-time or near real-time data. And uh, so near real-time, we're looking for uh, project teams to sort of define what near real-time means. Um, and you'll have a chance to maybe hear what other teams are thinking at the uh, project call pitch session. Uh, finally, you have to consider that the software tool will interface with different enterprise systems like CAD, CAM, MRO. Uh, analyze the relevant data and deliver this engineering feedback. And we are finally asking that the tool develop be a standalone uh, tool or a plugin for existing CAD environments. And so there's some more details about that as well. Uh, I want to find out if uh, any other members of the DMDI project team staff have any things I'd like to add at this point or if we've touched on pretty much everything. And it was kind of an exhaustive list of criteria and I, I buzzed through it. Again, you can find the full text of this in the PPK. Kevin, Katie, Tyler, anything that we've uh, missed here? So I guess just some color I'd add is that a lot of the methods for moving manufacturing to the left have involved uh, deterministic models that uh, seek to characterize um, known rules around manufacturability or impact on the environment or recycling and that sort of thing. 
Um, the, the spirit behind this project call has been to leverage the power of AI, which is advancing very quickly, and historical data to uh, discover opportunities to enhance those early design decisions based on that information uh, without having to model it all in advance in a deterministic sort of way. So we're looking for the project teams to identify the art of the possible and hence this very uh, aggressive uh, target as far as when something could be commercially ready, a first instance, if you will, that takes advantage of this approach. Good. Okay. So that brings us to about uh, half past. And at this point, I will invite uh, folks to submit any questions that you have. We're, you have us here for 30 minutes to answer any questions about the proposal. I know that we've just sort of thrown a lot at you, but hopefully you've had a chance to read through the PPK before this. Okay. We've got... First question is from Rendell Hughes. Please clarify DMBII's definition of early concept design phase in the context of this project. And then the question is to please clarify DMBII's definition of early concept design phase in the context of this project. Um, I think that one thing that, that we've talked about as a team as we've been building this proposal is that we actually are interested in uh, having proposers seek to bring uh, clarity and definition to a lot of these um, sometimes murky uh, definitions of what the what, where one phase of the of the product life cycle starts and where another phase ends. Um, so my my best stab at that question is as I think we would actually turn to teams to define that explicitly and call it out in the proposal and, and justify why that definition of early concept design phase is most fitting for this project. Um, does anybody from my team have any other things to add to that? Okay. Great. By the way, everybody, this meeting is being recorded, so you'll be able to access all of this afterwards. The next question is from Kristen Stone. If you could also, guys, please state your uh, organization when you um, give me a question, just so I can read that out to the rest of the group. So it is outlined in the PPK to have industry partners be the lead PI on the project. However, some industry partners are not at a tier one level who normally are the ones who can lead these DMDI projects. Due to this, can tier two or tier three industry partners be the PI and lead for these projects? I think Katie wants to help speak to this one. Yeah, so um, any organization, regardless of your tier, so long as you are a DMBI member, can be the lead organization. You don't have to be a tier one uh, industry member uh, or tier one member uh, in the organization. What we are asking is that uh, there be a technical uh, principal investigator identify who will be driving the technical aspects of the project. They don't have to be an employee of the lead organization. They have to be an employee of one of the project participants, but not of the lead organization. Okay. Um, sorry, if you couldn't hear me, I'll restate that. So any <laughs> any organization, so long as you're a DMDII member, can lead a project. Uh, you don't just have to be, uh, you know, you, you could be a tier one or a tier three um, industry provider or service provider uh, or an academic. What we're asking is that um, an industry partner identify a technical principal investigator um, to to drive the project, to drive the requirements, um, to drive the technology development effort. Um, that that is the specific request, and they can be of a, a tier one or a tier three. Um, it doesn't matter, but we are looking for that technical principal investigator to be a um, to be the an industry partner. And the reasoning. The reasoning behind that is because we want to make sure we're grounding 
these projects at the end of the day in industry and commercial use cases. So that's sort of the, the reasoning behind that. And next question is to clarify DMDI's intent with the discussion of IoT slash industrial IoT and the concept of historic data in the RFP. Uh, again, the question is, please clarify DMDI's intent with the discussion of IoT, industrial IoT, and the concept of historic data in the RFP. Uh, I can definitely uh, take a stab at that. So really what we're, what we're saying is we want, we want to distinguish between, um, we want to distinguish between AI and machine learning for design tools that use um, artificial intelligence to kind of work in the realm of physics-based models, um, or Kevin, you you had mentioned um, predict, predictive, deterministic and predictive modeling. And so the question really here is, the, the intention is to deploy these really powerful um, systems of artificial intelligence, uh, artificially intelligent systems to uh, analyze large amounts of, of data that are available um, from past enterprise activity. So um, past manufacturing data, um, past assembly data, past supply chain data. There's a lot of, of data as, as, as everybody is, is aware of, there's a lot of data that's available um, that has been generated by you know, years and years of, of an enterprises or an OEM's uh, production. And so the the intention is to find is to ask how can we best um, you know leverage that data as a resource. Um, um, just to add to that, so I'm not sure the uh, quite the, the, the spirit of the question, but um, um, the first the first focus is on leveraging existing historic data. Which may, which may have been collected by some sort of IoT mechanism, uh, quality control systems downstream, for instance, collect data that can be associated with characteristics of a part or certain sort of design rules that were used. Um, it, may, it may be the project teams, uh, it may be of interest to the project team to specify additional data types and, and new, new IoT kind, kind of instrumentation that could gather that data to enrich those models over time. Over time. But, but we, want we want to be able to do what's, what's possible with existing data, data first, and then, and then consider, consider how, that how that can be improved upon um, you know, over, over, time over time in the future. I think that clarifies. So it looks like... Uh, uh, Randall, uh, Randall, if that helps or does not help, you can message me and we can take it offline too. But thanks again for the question. Uh, glad to hear that you guys are already thinking through some of the ins and outs of this RFP. Uh, I'm looking through the list of questions and I actually don't see any more. So. Second from the bottom from Mohammed. Uh, okay, here's this question. I am working now at, uh, in a digital product in my company and we finished the digital thread. How can I get your support in the digital twin implementation? Um, how can, okay, so the question is asking how can we get your support in digital twin implementation? Given that they are not a US company. Right. Well, uh, the answer is unfortunately uh, that you cannot because we only uh, work with members that are that have operations in the U.S. But thanks for the question and the interest. Okay. Uh, well, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, yeah, I don't believe if nobody has any further questions, we will just give it a few minutes. I'll stick around for a few more minutes if you want to uh, shoot me a message. And um, I've got this time booked off till, uh, till 2 Central. But thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that you found this valuable. Uh, we'll post the recording and make it um, available on the membership portal so you can 
uh, get the review of this if you need to. As always, feel free to shoot me an email with any specific questions. And we look forward to having you sign up for the uh, pitch session, and we will see everybody at that in a couple weeks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Um, Suraj asked to clarify, their, clarify their, their requirement of commercialization by 2020. And, uh, and uh, the yeah, the background for that requirement, because I didn't do it too briefly before, before um, was an interest in, in driving some urgency, urgency around this project. Um, you know, an AI, AI project with this kind with of this scope, kind of scope could easily, could easily uh, become, become a boil the ocean kind of exercise. Of exercise. And, and, um, um, and, not and not go very deep in terms, in terms of driving an end to end solution in the, in the foreseeable future. future. So, in so order, in order to, to um, put, put an, an appropriate bias on meaningful outcomes, outcomes that, that, could be, that, could that could benefit manufacturers, manufacturers and, our and our members sooner rather than later, sooner rather than later we, set we set an aggressive target, target of whatever, whatever is proposed, proposed we, would we would like to see a line of sight plan, plan to, to actually make it commercially available sometime in the year 2020 which which gives you basically, you know, basically about, about two years, years. Uh, the 20 uh, the 20 year of 2019 plus 2020 to execute, to execute the project and, and Transition, transition and to a point, point where you in some form are commercially available, available for, for manufacturers to take advantage, advantage of this, this capability. capability. It, that, that there should then, should then form, form uh, some, uh, some of the scoping that we would expect the project teams to decide, decide for themselves as to, as to what, what kinds, kinds of data, data types are available today, today and now. now. Uh, what, uh, what kinds, kinds, of, kinds of insights might be derived from those data, data types that, are, that, that add value, again, again to, a to a design engineer in this near-term near time frame? So hopefully, so hopefully you can appreciate how that kind of forcing, forcing function with a, with a rather urgent timeline can shift the focus toward pragmatic solutions where, where um, again, the power, the power of AI is used perhaps in a very modest way, but delivering value. Uh, uh, sooner rather than later, with, with essentially a roadmap for much, for much more grand capabilities over time. Hopefully, hopefully that uh, explains the rationale there.
who wants to answer that? So we've got another question for those of you that are uh, hanging on to see if there will be any last minute questions. Your patience has paid off because we do have a question, uh, which is how much can or will DMDAI facilitate in getting access to data? I think Katie wants to take this one. So um, uh, I think that this is really important as, as the, the team gets put together. Um, the, the team needs to work together to get the access to data. Um, we can try to help provide additional data, but there's no guarantees that we can get that data for you. That's why it's really important to have an industry partner that's willing to work with, um, work with you and sees, sees the reasoning for it. Um, we do have... Uh, some capabilities for providing data um, via the manufacturing, um, what's going on in our future factory. Um, but in order to have a, an implementation effect, we think that you're going to have to have a, a real world use case given, given to you by one of your uh, industry partner, partners. So, um, so while we can help, it is the team's responsibility to ensure that they can get that data um, within their team. Another question, um, how is DMDII defining BAI, the artificial intelligence? Um, we, I'll, I'll speak for myself uh, that when I use the term AI, I mean uh, those computer science technologies in the broadest sense that enable um, learning from data. Uh, whether it be supervised or unsupervised learning. And uh, that, that's meant to be an umbrella term that, uh, that covers all the particular techniques that are explored, machine learning, um, you know, deep learning with neural networks, and so on. So we're not being specific about which techniques be utilized, but rather that um, this is a, uh, you know, we're asking for computer science techniques that leverage historical data to establish models that may be known or not known by humans. You know, it, how it gets there is not as important as that there's evidence that it's useful and dependable. Um, we have Jim Barkley in the room. Would you add any further color on uh, the use of AI, the definition? I mean, I think you covered it pretty well. Um, the, yeah, I mean, you know, machine learning and deep learning are kind of the hottest topics right now. Uh, as you get further down the, the path of deep learning, you're getting closer to sort of general intelligence, <laughs> uh, you know, but, uh, so there's some, some wacky stuff way out there, but for the commercialization uh, path that you guys are looking for, yeah, I'd probably go, with, um, it would take sort of a more conscribed view. I know it's a pretty fuzzy area where there's a lot of debate about the definition of AI versus machine learning and so on. But but again, our, our intent is to call for the broad set of tools that fall under that meta category of AI, artificial intelligence. Okay, so the question 